around this goal type order? Yeah, well, we can, um, I'll, um, I've got a series of questions that work pretty well here, so um, we'll get, we can uh, make sure we're recording here. This is going, and this is going. So, this Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Wednesday, October the 24th in the year 2007 here in the group study room at the Niles Public Library. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea, I'm a member of the Reference Services staff here, and I'm speaking with Mr. Sam Schechter. Um, Mr. Schechter uh, was born on May 23rd, uh, 1929 in Chicago and we're um, most appreciative that he has found the time to come in today and to participate in the Veterans History Project here at the Niles Library. Um, Mr. Schechter uh, prepared for this interview and uh, collected his thoughts and he also uh, has his, uh, there's also two ladies present in the room, Gail and Judith, who are both familiar with uh, um, some of the stories that Mr. Uh, Schechter may be sharing with us. So um, that kind of sets the stage here in the room. And now I'm going to uh, proceed with the, uh, with the interview. Um, Mr. Schechter, uh, when did you enter the service? In January of 51. January of 1951. And uh, at that time you were living in? Chicago. Chicago. Illinois. Illinois. May I ask where you went to, to high school? Uh, Tooley and Crane. Tooley and Crane. Um, what were you doing before you entered the service? Do you recall? Or? I worked at uh, various jobs, which I don't recollect uh, uh, right now. I uh, was so fishing to uh, find myself. Surely. So you would have gone into the service then. Um, when you were about uh, 21. 21. So were you drafted or did drafted. you know you were drafted? And you were drafted into what branch of service? <coughs> Army. The Army. Were you, ha were you? Did it make any difference to you which branch of service that you went into? No. No. And when you were younger, you would have been growing up, I suppose, during World War II. And uh, now there was a, another war. Uh, underway. Did, uh, Correct. did you have any thoughts about uh, going to war or having to serve in the military? or? Uh... Well, I of course uh, consider myself a uh, patriotic American and I uh, <clears throat> wanted to serve my country. However, I had so many other irons in the fire as a civilian and so I wasn't uh, exactly uh, Gun hole to leave my uh, civilian pursuits. Yeah. So, um, where were you inducted into the into the army? Uh, I ended up. Well, it's been, uh, gosh, maybe about uh, sixty years thereabouts, and uh, I just remember being taking basic in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Fort Leonard Wood, I think, yeah. And how was basic training? Was that uh, a shock on the system, or pretty much in one no, would expect? No, it was kind of a uh, snap. It was kind of uh, very easy. I think probably was so easy because at the time, as one general said, we need quickly warm bodies in Korea. Mm. We were very short-handed over there, and the enemy was pushing us all around. <coughs> so. They kind of, it seemed to me, uh, pushed us right through everything and uh, shipped us out as soon as they could. Yeah. Was that the first time you'd been uh, away from home for any length of time? Or? No. No. And uh, so you had done a bit of traveling around the country before then, so. Yeah, I wasn't tied to my mother's apron strings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, boot camp was pretty much as you expected and uh, you didn't find it difficult adjusting to, uh, to army life or... <laughs> No, different, types, different types of people that you might not normally encounter. And uh, I thought it was a little bit uh, of a waste of time. 
didn't really learn much in uh, basic. So you wind up in the, in the third division. Third division, third medic battalion, clearing company. And you, they, you were assigned to that uh, unit after basic training, is that right? Uh, no. I uh, went over after basic. I uh, didn't go over as a unit, but as a, uh, a replacement, as an individual to uh, Incheon, uh, Korea, uh, where there was about 25,000 GIs. It was called a repo depot, and when other units needed re uh, replacements, uh, they would call down to this uh, repo depot in uh, Incheon, Korea, uh, for the amount of troops that they needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to get from the United States to Korea, that was by boat? Boat. In that dock in Japan then, or? Uh... Uh, yeah, I was in Japan, well, maybe about um, five or six days, and uh, next thing I knew, we were in Korea. Korea. And then you landed at, at Incheon? Or that was where the, the unit was uh, <coughs> stationed. I believe I landed at uh, Incheon in that repo depot, that repo depot. containing about 25,000-30,000 GIs. Okay. Um, so you're, the, the, the duty or the, the purpose of the 3rd Medical Battalion and how you were deployed there? It was like, uh, did you ever watch MASH on TV? Yes. Well, that's the kind of outfit I was in. Uh, we a very small outfit. Uh, we had one doctor, and uh, we had a total of maybe 30 uh, personnel and the whole unit. I interviewed one um, gentleman, and he was uh, a dentist in Korea, and he used the same term. He said, if you saw that show MASH, he said, that's sort of what it was like. We didn't have such colorful personnel. Actually, we were all about uh, 20, 21 years old. <clears throat> Nobody... Uh, really knew anything about the Army. Nobody knew where Korea was in a map, nor did they care. We were all draftees. And most of us were not happy to be where we ended up at. Why was that? We were draftees. I see. Were you, were you fearful? Were you afraid of the, the danger? And well, I uh, wasn't looking for a hot war. Yeah. I uh, know if uh, you get hit by a bullet, uh, you know, you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. The, um, so was it, was it, the, um, where you're stationed in Korea now, was that a particular camp or? Um... One day, they, uh, when I was at this Incheon Repo Depot, they called my name out with along uh, about 250 others, loaded us on uh, a dozen uh, two and a half ton trucks, and we headed up to the front line. And when I heard our artillery, the vehicles all uh, pulled to the side of the road. An officer opened up a metal folding table and starts to interview uh, each of us as to what our qualifications were and what we did in civilian life. And um, those that had no uh, professions that the military needed went to the line on the left. Those who knew something, like me, I was a uh, mechanic, went to the line on the right. Those on the left, I understand, then did immediately ended up on the front line. And those on the right, electricians, uh, mechanics, and others, uh, we ended up in uh, those kind of jobs. And that's how I became a uh, motor sergeant. And uh, I ended up... Uh, taking care of all the vehicles. Was it good equipment that you were working with, or was it new machinery or leftover from World War II, or...? No, the vehicles um, were all uh, satisfactory. And when uh, I needed parts, why well, I would go to uh, Ordnance Ammo, where they had all kinds of equipment. As far as the eye could see, and I would... Uh, acquire, or some would say requisition, uh, whatever parts I uh, needed. The, um, <laughs> there's a new book out now, I think, by Halberstam on the Korean War, the, was it the coldest, the coldest year, I think. Um, was it, was it hard, was it 
were conditions cold or? Oh yes, in winter time we had uh, mid twenties. We were usually in the mountains, so it was damp along uh, with twenty five below zero. So, and that uh, cold dampness kind of got right into your bones. You were still able to work though in the cold or yeah. Whatever. Fortunately, we were all young and healthy. Yeah. And so we uh, managed to uh, do what we had to do. Yeah. You didn't lose any weight or no. gain any weight? No. At all? Actually, we had uh, decent food. And gosh, about every uh, couple of weeks, or the, you know, it's been 60, uh, five, 65 years now. So some of the thoughts are a little bit hazy in my mind, but. Uh, I remember a lot of helicopters coming from Japan with fresh vegetables. I remember helicopters coming in with um, crates of gloves and hats sewn by ex women ex auxiliary organizations, veteran auxiliary organizations. And we had so much of these knitted gloves and scarves and stuff, which was not really usable. The military uh, gear we had was more than sufficient. We had very warm clothes. Uh, we had um, really everything we need. And we had, I know a lot of people probably are going to have trouble getting used to this idea, but we had so much brought in by helicopters. Uh, we had to dig holes in the ground to bury the stuff. I used to say to my company commander, well, can't we give it to the uh, native uh, villagers and all that? He says, no, it's against uh, military uh, uh, regulations. So. Uh, every time we saw a helicopter, we knew we had to start digging holes and bury all that stuff that was coming in. We got fresh ice cream from Japan, we got fresh uh, vegetables. And <clears throat> what's interesting, we had two uh, South Korean soldiers, they were called rocks, attached to our outfit. And um, when there was a native village, maybe three or four miles away, they would uh, hustle over there rather than eat our food. When they asked why, they said American food is not good for them. And so, uh, unlike World War II, or perhaps other parts of the world, we really long for nothing. You're well supported. Uh, we had uh, provisioned uh, everything. Did, Judith, did you want to? You passed what? right over my favorite story. When he asked about the cold, why did you not tell the generator story? Oh, yes. oh well, we didn't. Uh, well, you know, I was the mechanic, and I also was in charge of um, keeping the company wired up electrically. We had a generator, and I, uh, of course, uh, was the only one who understood those things. And sometimes it would, uh, the engine would stop working, the lights would go off, two in the morning. 27 below zero, and I have to get out there and uh, work on the uh, cold uh, metal parts and get the generators going again. And um, you know, I enjoyed it. I'll tell you why. I felt very, very useful. I felt very, very capable. And I was proud of myself knowing that I was pretty much uh, indispensable. And it gave me a feeling of, uh, of worth. So the Army got that right anyway. They had the right man in the right place. I was a pretty bad soldier in basic training. But in Korea, uh, I had a job. Nobody bothered me. And I rose to the challenge. And I've had a lot of those experiences before I got uh, into the service. Were there any other, were there any particularly humorous or funny events that you would recall? Is there anything very unusual that stands out in your mind? Uh, well, we had uh, many times uh, camp followers, as most armies usually have. And uh, they were, uh, I wouldn't say funny, but they were interesting. So did they all of a sudden, like these um, little shacks would spring up around the camp and people would move in there and not stay? Really. No? Not really, because we had to move, it seems, every month or two. 
something like communist guerrillas were working uh, behind the lines attacking service outfits. And so for some reason, um, we had to move like uh, every month or two to a new location. And they would have to organize the convoy, take down the tents, and go out to the new area and spread a couple of hundred gallons of gasoline out on a field and burn all the weeds and uh, things like this. And I don't know about funny, but one time, a couple of times I almost killed myself. I spread about 200 gallons of gasoline all over this field where we were going to set up the new camp. And then I uh, backed off about 25 feet and I threw a match. Well, I didn't account for the fumes in the air. The whole horizon blew up in front of me and blew me back about 25 feet. And I uh, think I burnt some of the hair off my head. And uh, that was not funny, it was really stupid. Yeah. Then another time, thinking I was a great swimmer, I took one of the, uh, along with a few other truck drivers, we took our trucks down to a stream to wash them. And loving to swim, I decided to jump into this river. And my fellow truck driver said, Sam, you better not. It's an awful strong current. But I was full of uh, piss and vinegar and loved water. And I jumped in to go for a swim. And immediately I knew I did the wrong thing. It felt like a jolly green giant, giant grabbed a hold of me and sucked me right out to the center. I tried to swim back to shore. I couldn't make one foot of headway. So I flattened out and uh, floated down with the current about five miles down. Wow. <clears throat> you can't swim out of uh, that kind of current. Then I seen a big flat rock and I scooted up onto the rock. Now I could have gotten into shore, but I was afraid to do that because during the dry season, mines were planted under that river. And so, I sat there, considering my uh, choices, and then the uh, few of my uh, buddies came with their trucks, and they uh, backed off about 150 feet and threw me a line. They had these uh, winches, you know, in the front of the truck, and with the other end, I tied a bunch of uh, logs that were by the edge of the river. And as they winched these logs the 150 feet towards the trucks, it gouged out the land. So I walked into where it was gouged out and uh, got back to the truck. And they said, well, that should teach you something, and it did. <laughs> so there was, you, weren't, you didn't get any, uh, there was no disciplinary action taken or anything like that against you, or no? Everybody was glad to see you back. Uh, there was no discipline. No. Do you know the name of the river? Was there? Was it a? Oh, I don't know. We didn't know the names of rivers. Yeah. One of our. Uh, remember, one of the vets was talking about the in the Injun River. But, but uh, I. Uh, that doesn't ring any bells. Okay. That was a strong river. Oh yeah. Yeah. Strong current. Now, were you ever, was, it, was your unit ever fired upon? One time, we had a couple artillery shells that uh, landed and perhaps uh, few hundred yards away. Why, I don't know. And I don't know, we don't know where those shells came from. So after that, we were instructed to build um, foxholes, you call them. Mm -hmm. And then we put uh, logs over the top. But they were very unsafe, because quite often they caved in. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I, I noticed the um, in here 
and you've touched on some of these in the notes that you prepared for today's interview, uh, which we appreciate. Um, and I think you mentioned it on the phone, and I, I thought it was very interesting, was during a dangerous period there, you had a special guest or visitor. Oh, yeah. Uh, one time we got um, some information that communist guerrillas were lurking behind the lines, eliminating, attacking uh, service outfits. And um, about that time, I see a jeep coming up our, uh, into our company area. And I noticed it was an old guy, and an old guy with a beard. And I'm thinking, who's, who's this? It turned out, he gets out of his Jeep, he says, I'm looking for uh, Schechter, and I says, that's me. And he says, I'm Rabbi so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, <laughs> he had a jar of uh, kosher dill pickles, uh, kosher salami, uh, pumpernickel bread, and uh, gosh, a shopping bag full of stuff. And just as quickly, he turned around and uh, got in his Jeep, and off he went, uh, heading north, I guess, to look up other Jewish guys and other outfits. And I took this food stuff into my tent, and my uh, southern buddy said, what's that? And I said, it's Jew food. And they, um, being southern boys, who are apt to eat anything, dug right into it. And within 15 minutes, uh, everything was gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> yeah, you meet all kinds of people in the Army, don't you? Surprisingly, I got along uh, very well with the uh, Southern boys because they were, uh, it seems, more uh, wild and more game than the Yankee boys, as I was more game. More, uh, I welcomed excitement and new things. Yeah. Southern boys seem, seem to be like that, too. Yeah. Yankee boys were a little more serious, and they pretty much wanted to get home. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, um, I've heard some of them that say that they this is, they came to value the company and the, and the performance of the southern southerners in, in uh, you might battle call situations. Them, yeah. You might call them like good old boys. Yeah. Yeah. And they all seem to know how to sing. <laughs> At stronger guitar. Stronger guitar. Um, we had a uh, a young Mexican guy in our tent, and he was always unusually quiet. And I knew there was something not normal. One day he just blew up, called it a nervous breakdown, or. Uh, I guess he wasn't used to being away from home, and um, we had to ship him out. Oh, um, a little bit of a mental yeah, problem. And the uh, guys I was with were not a very educated bunch, and I remember uh, writing love letters for uh, many of them to their girlfriends. Oh. <laughs> they thought I had something to offer. Yeah, you're a man of many talents there. I wonder if any of those uh, people ever got married. Or... And, uh... I got a kick out of writing yeah. love letters. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something else they used to do. <clears throat> I hope the military doesn't <clears throat> uh, see me about this, but We had uh, gas heaters in those days. The advantage of a gas heater in a vehicle, they gave you immediate heat. So officers used to come from far and wide, majors, colonels, and bribe me to put heaters in their personal vehicles. And I'd say, but don't you have mechanics in your units? They said, they just don't know how to do those things. And, uh, and of course, they pulled out a bottle. I learned in the service, nothing is for nothing. One hand washes the other. And so, uh, after they asked me three or four times, 
I'd say, okay, Colonel. I'd say, relieve him of the bottle. And I'd uh, put the gas heater in their vehicle. <clears throat> then my reputation spread, and many other officers came. So I, uh, of course, had a lot of booze uh, and beer for my outfit. And I didn't drink much myself, and stupidly, I didn't sell anything. And then, being motor sergeant, I uh, would get, I had time, and I sometimes would get bored. And I would write myself a trip ticket, which you needed, because we had checkpoints like every 10 miles up and down the road. And uh, you couldn't uh, drive a vehicle without some kind of uh, authorization. The authorization would say, requested by who? Purpose of who? Driver name, authorized by, and of course, everything was me. Requested by same sector, sergeant sector, required uh, driver same sector, uh, business same sector. <clears throat> and so I had all this freedom. And we had a lot of, and I'm hesitant to say this, I would gather up some of my our M1 carbines. And we had a number of different um, armies over there. We had yes. South Africans, mm -hmm. we had Turks, we had Greeks, we had uh, Puerto Ricans, we had uh, and so on. And I quickly discovered everybody wants everybody else's guns. And so I would pull into a uh, English outfit and I hold up a gun. Automatically, everybody understood what this meant. And they'd come over with two, three cases of beer. And they'd give them a gun. And so my outfit was really well supplied with beer and booze. And See, all. You, you were popular for many reasons. Well, I was a salesman also before I got into the service. And I learned at an early age a little BS goes a long way. <laughs> so did you get, to, when were you promoted to sergeant? <clears throat> Well, how it worked when my motor in a war zone, when my motor sergeant rotated home, the corporal became motor sergeant. When that sergeant rotated home, the PF, the PFC became corporal, and so on. Got it. Yeah. If I wanted to become a, a master sergeant, uh, I could have if I. Uh, stayed another nine months, I could end up a, a master sergeant. So you get ranked very easily in a war zone. And where I was at, it was in a war zone where we got, I think, four points a month. In the rear, you got two points a month. And the amount of points determined how quickly you would rotate home. So I think I was there uh, approximately 12 months. I got four points a month. That was 48 points is what I think you needed to rotate home. And uh, there wasn't uh, many places <clears throat> or much uh, to do for uh, entertainment except to uh, go to Seoul, the capital, where the uh, ladies were. And interestingly, there wasn't, I don't remember, one decent building in all of Seoul, which was the capital. I understand before I got there, when they, MacArthur and the American troops landed at Incheon, they just about leveled the city. And so, there was a lot of little cubby holes that uh, the uh, ladies uh, lived in. And uh, that was as far as the, uh, as much entertainment as uh, we had. Though once in a while we had American uh, Entertainers? actors and yeah. actresses would come and oh, put yes. on a little show. Yeah. But they weren't really very exciting like we were able to uh, find in Seoul. <laughs> okay, you um, And then, oddly I thought, 
I needed certain, like spark plugs and other things, to repair the vehicles. And I would go to Ordnance Ammo to request these things. And I found it wasn't that easy. The guy in charge would say, well, what do you got for me? And I said, listen, we're fighting a war here. I'm in the same army as you. I'm trying to keep these ambulances and vehicles going. And to no avail. So I had to many times <clears throat> uh, resort to just uh, acquiring and requisitioning the things that I needed. Mm -hmm on my own in many different ways. Sometimes I had to give a carton of cigarettes to get uh, some parts I needed for trucks. And so it took a lot of um, imagination to uh, operate efficiently. Yeah. Had you taken a lot of um, mechanic mechanical oriented courses in high school or? No. No, I uh, just grew up uh, fixing my own car. So that really had an effect on your uh, time in the Army because of this mechanical aptitude that you developed. I talked to it like a duck to water. Yeah. Of course, I grew up with a lot of Sicilians, which gave me, enabled me to get additional mechanical experience. <laughs> I love your expressions. Um, I'm afraid to say something. Yeah. Mr. Schechter, on your um, biographical data form, um, there's a part here where it talks about your medals and your special service mm -hmm. awards. So you, you probably did receive some medals, right? Well, they were, uh, you know, my uniform Yeah. with the uh, battle stars. Yeah. Why we got battle stars, I don't know. I guess it's like generals who fly over areas and they get 10 more ribbons, you know. Uh, just being in that combat zone, we got battle stars. <clears throat> and so, you know, I really don't remember exactly what decorations, but we... Uh, but you mentioned there about uh, uh, you had a, a, a truck ran over your foot. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Probably uh, clumsiness and that uh, disturbed the uh, piece of bone in my big toe. And when I got back to the States, I had a uh, cookie operation on it by two very young doctors which took a total of 15 minutes, did a perfect job. In five days, I was brand new again. That operation back here in the States in 07 probably would have cost me $5,000. For sure, yeah. Of course, these young doctors, you know, in combat zones, they get a lot of experience quick. Mm. Yeah. So that operation on your foot, though, that took place in, in, uh, in Chicago. Fort McCoy. Fort McCoy. Okay, Wisconsin. Yeah. So, so do you say here that you're a little disabled as a result of that or anything? <clears throat> no. That didn't result in any disability then, the, the injury to your foot. <clears throat> well, I'm, uh, I get $115 a month being 10% disabled. Now, if the military thought I was not disabled, I might be relieved of that 10% yeah. disability. So obviously they feel I'm entitled to it. Oh yeah. Physically. Yeah. By that I mean I understand certain GIs do lose their disability when they're returned to uh, health. And of course, uh, my toe still bothers me. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So were you able to sort of uh, grin and bear it and keep working on the tr on the in the in the in the <coughs> yeah. garage? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I was uh, 
very uh, healthy, strong, capable, flexible, and uh, kind of enjoyed what I was doing. Yeah. So um, nobody gave me any orders, and that's when I worked my best. Yes. Yeah. My um, company commander never said nothing to me. Do you remember his name? Clifton, Captain Clifton. Captain. He would give us a talk like once a month against the dangers of playing around with the girls, <clears throat> saying our antibiotics will not cure some of the diseases they have here. Immediately upon finishing his lecture, he came to the motor pool and says, Schechter, you got my Jeep? And off he went to Sewell. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now the other guys in the unit, they didn't have that freedom. He did and I did. So, uh, so how many miles, was it a long drive to, uh, to the capital from there? Well, we were usually somewhere around the 38th parallel. And I don't remember exactly how far it was from there to Seoul. I would only guess maybe <clears throat> an hour's drive or 35 miles maybe. But um, even though you're enjoying this uh, type am. of service for, for the Army and you're contributing to the greater good, you're still looking forward to going home though, are you? Obviously. I couldn't get, I couldn't wait. Couldn't wait. To get, even though they wanted to send me to uh, OCS, Officers Candidate School, and train me to fly helicopters. I wanted to get back home to my Harley Davidson and my wild eye fun loving girlfriends. Oh, so you had a Harley Davidson back then. That's what I grew up on. Oh no, oh that yeah, that seems like that's a descriptive detail, isn't it? Yeah. Who wants to go to school when you can have that kind of fun? Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, so you do your um, <clears throat> you said almost a year the eleven months and you accumulate <clears throat> all the points and then the time comes to go back to the go back to the states yeah uh, mm -hmm. and you looked forward to it um, yes I did now you did have some re rest or recreation or furlough or leave in in the, in the capital city did you get to go to Japan for any time for like a long weekend or something well, only about week? five days five about days. to Korea. And only about uh, four or five days uh, en route uh, back to uh, America. We went over on a uh, slow boat, and I think um, it was a boat going back to uh, California, and from there they flew us back to um, uh, excuse me, I'm having a senior moment. Uh, 45 miles north of Chicago. Fort Sheridan? Fort Sheridan, I think, yeah. And then I ended up, I had another uh, couple of months to go until my enlistment was over, and I was shipped to uh, Fort McCoy. And they put me in charge of uh, a large motor pool since I had that MOS, which uh, designates uh, our, uh, our job. And I was in charge of issuing driver's licenses for a good part of the camp. Until one day the camp commander called me and he says, Schechter, do you have a driver's license for this camp? And I says, no. He said, oh, we've got to do something about that. I said, after I issued about two, three hundred driver's licenses. And uh, somehow, I don't recall exactly, we worked it out. Fort McCoy is in Benning, Kansas, Fort McCoy? No, it's in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, that's right. Sorry. Sorry. And then, I think the idea the Army had to take combat returnees, like I was, to mix us in with the green troops, and that something good would wear off on the new recruits. But <clears throat> I don't think that worked out very well. They would put me in charge of details. You'd go out to the woods and uh, break up some rocks. 
or dig out a tree. It was really uh, useless stuff. And so I would park my rear down on the ground with my back up against a tree, and of course the ten man detail would uh, follow suit. Mm-hmm. And then one day they, uh, a jeep came out with four officers and found us sitting on our rear. And that was the last time they put me in charge of uh, details. But then I only had another three, four weeks to go. But, you know, why work when it was uh, really just meant to keep the troops busy? Yeah, busy work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did, um, so they brought you back to Fort Sheridan then and you were, and you were discharged there, mm-hmm. right, after the time in Fort McCoy? I think so. Yeah. And did you, you, did you have any, you didn't have any trouble, it sounds like, readjusting to life as a civilian? Not at all. Quite the contrary. <clears throat> Compared to the career of Vietnamese vets who came back crying yeah. and walked around in fatigues for years making a, uh, a job out of it, a business out of it. Uh, no, we Korean guys, and we came back, and we says, well, okay, and just were back and took up where we left off at. Never the thought of uh, crying yeah. or feeling we were unfair, unfairly uh, victimized. Never yeah. entered our minds. Yeah. Sometimes I think <clears throat> the news media sometimes puts those, uh, you might want to say the uh, liberal media, puts those ideas into return the soldiers for having something to write about. And so I think a lot of the soldiers pick this up in the paper and say, hey, we can use that. Look, look how we suffered. And um, kind of try to wear that as some kind of badge of honor, which it in my opinion, was not. No, I never saw this with returnees from World War II, with few exceptions. Maybe soldiers who were in foxholes for four years, perhaps a few. I didn't see it with any Korean vets. We only seen it with uh, Vietnamese vets. Did you, um, I don't know, do you think that's interesting? I do think it's interesting. Yeah, the, the, the Vietnam veterans. Uh, I haven't interviewed. We have, we've interviewed one Vietnam veteran so far, and I didn't do the interview. I did have one reservation. I missed the local ladies. <laughs> the um, <clears throat> can I tell you something off record? Uh, okay. If I can just pause this for a moment, you can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Schechter for allowing me to collect my thoughts. Um, yes, th- this, um, your responsibility, your position of authority uh, up near uh, the 38th parallel, you were the uh, motor sergeant um, and you had quite a bit of uh, authority in that position. Um, yes, the motor sergeant is responsible for all the vehicles. If a vehicle was uh, needed to be serviced uh, because uh, if it wasn't, more damage uh, would uh, result to the vehicle. So they were, I think, what was called a red line and uh, nobody was able to use that vehicle. If they did and more damage occurred, they would directly be responsible for that. And so my company commander had to, uh, for those reasons, ask me for a vehicle. And of course, I always kept his vehicle in tip-top shape. Even if I had to run his vehicle off a, a cliff and go to Ordnance Ammo and get him a brand new one, 
Wow. Now, were these Jeeps? Is this a Jeep? Jeeps, Jeep? three quarter tons, two and a half ton. Yeah. You worked on all those vehicles. <laughs> they were fairly simple in those days. Yeah. Were they made by General Motors or Ford or <clears throat> Cummings or somebody? Or? I believe they were all American made. American made. We didn't do real heavy work, like transmission or heavy motor work. Uh, those kind of jobs were sent to the rear, where they had a very big uh, uh, <clears throat> garages uh, for uh, design for that. Yeah. So did, when you had to move the camp, you mentioned when you had to burn the field, and then you see you move the camp. So all the vehicles have to move at oh, that yes. time too, in a convoy yes. or something. Well, then when they're are they parked in a tent or parked out just out in the open or our vehicles? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're just out in the open. Well, I'd like to tell you something else. I don't know how it's going to go over with the authorities, but we got replacements. As the older guys rotated home, we got sure. replacements. <laughs> and it's up to uh, me to make them uh, truck drivers. And many times I'd say to these replacements, have you ever driven a truck before? And they said, no. And I would uh, complain to my company commander that uh, driving a truck through the mountains with full loads of ammunition, and the reason for that, frontline outfits sometimes would uh, request uh, service outfits to form convoys and bring them ammunition. So sometimes uh, we delegate maybe three, four of our trucks to go to a certain area, get loaded up with artillery shells, get into this convoy, and head up to the front line. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> driving a truck fully loaded through the mountains with terrible narrow dirt and partially washed out roads takes a lot of experience and know-how. And when I complained to my company commander, who was a really nice guy for an officer, that uh, we're floating with extreme danger here, he'd say, well, do you want to rotate home or not? Because if we don't have new guys, you guys ain't going anywhere. And so I would try to break them in and tell them when you're going around turns, this load is apt to turn you over. And <clears throat> I've seen many go out and not come back. Oh, really? Here. I still feel very somewhat guilty about that. Because they might have been these uh, drivers who went over the edge because of the unbalanced, the low, the way they were driving. Some of those drivers would, have, would have, you would have tried to instruct them or advise them. Yeah, I tried, but uh, you can't um, teach somebody to drive loaded ammunition trucks through the mountains on dirt washboard roads that sometimes would only accommodate one vehicle. And when you met on a, on a coaching vehicle from the other coming at you, why you would have to do a lot of backing up and all kinds of uh, screwing around somehow to get by each other. One time I got, another time I got bored was being in a motor pool. And I took a vehicle and I went to, got loaded up with ammunition and got in this convoy and headed up to the front line. And I'm going up one of these mountain roads. And coming down this mountain road, of course in the other direction, was a jeep. I remember he was a captain. I saw the captain bars. He was sitting in the back. And the driver was an African American. They were coming down, I'm going up, and they're coming around this turn, and somehow they never made the turn. And I watched them sail right through midair, and I was shocked. There was no change of expression on the captain in the back 
or the driver of the front, and down they went until they were out of sight. And I'm sure nobody ever went looking for them. Wow. Oh, lots of things like that. Um, in fact, after that one trip through those mountain roads to bring ammunition to a frontline outfit, but all the experiences I've had, I drove cars, I drove motorcycles, and I drove trucks before I got in the Army. After that one trip, I was not a hankering to volunteer again and take a, a truck through the mountains again. How those guys that survived, those that did survive, how they did, had to be an act of God. Because I've had a lot of experience and I wasn't a hankering to do that again. Yeah. And we, uh, we, of course, have to stay in guard. I forgot exactly whether it was two or three hours, which was a little tough at 25 below zero, 18 inches of snow until you're relieved. And sometimes you weren't. The one who was supposed to relieve you was asleep. You know, really, we were all kids, 19, 20, 21 years old, without much uh, experiences in life. And if Mama wasn't around to wake some of their sons up, they never got up. So sometimes you would have to go into the tent and wake the guy up who was supposed to relieve you for guard duty. One time we got a new lieutenant who turned out to be a pretty nice guy. But at two in the morning, the generator crapped out. The engine stopped. <clears throat> the lights went out. Well, he comes into the tent and he started um, pulling rank on me. Get out there and start that thing and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't like his attitude. But being a good soldier, I went out and I worked on the engine till my fingers turned all white, which happened quite often which bothered me for a, uh, four or five, six years after I got out of the service. Yeah. It destroys the, um, <clears throat> the blood supply, you know, in the fingers. They used to turn all white. So I'd come in periodically and hang my fingers over the oil stove, jump around while they're defrosting. And the lieutenant would come in, what are you doing in here? I told you to get that things going. And I'd say, well, lieutenant, tell you what, if you think you can do better than me, Feel free. So he went back into his tent, I guess, uh, the captain told him that's not the way to go about talking to Mr. Schefter. <laughs> yeah, so the lieutenant came back in the tent. He said, listen, I apologize. Uh, you know, I'm just new here and I, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and so, like I said earlier, he turned out to be a really nice guy. He was just new. And I forgave him for that, you know. And you got the generator going here. Yeah, and eventually, oh, I used to freeze my fingers all the time. But uh, I was kind of used to that. When I was 16, 17, everybody had old cars and it wouldn't start in wintertime. We had to take out the plugs and throw ether into the combustion chambers and use blow torches to heat up the plugs and all that kind of stuff. So. I had a lot of this type of experience, but uh, my fingers turning white all the time. That's kind of scary. I didn't bargain for that. Yeah. But I was just uh, when I started a job, I had to finish it, and it took me uh, oh gosh, after being out of the service four, five, six years, it 
my fingers got a little bit cold, they start turning white. Yeah. And finally, uh, they seem to have normalized after uh, half a dozen years. But I suppose whenever your hands feel really cold, it must take you back to. Uh, it could take you back to those times in uh, Korea when your hands got all, you know, white with the cold. Not really. No, it doesn't. <clears throat> there was just uh, 13 months over there, kind of like being on a camp, Rob did boy. Yeah. When and uh, no uh, psychological hang-ups. Be just out there, sweating like hell in summer and freezing like hell in winter, and then uh, after 12, 13 months, it was over. And uh, no big deal. And then we're back home. I'm just sorry I didn't was unable to spend more time in Japan. Speaking of Japan, that brings back something interesting. After I was there about five, six, seven months, uh, I was given the R and R, which was rest and recuperation in Japan. And we got off the plane, and. I'm looking at 50 beautiful Japanese women all lined up in front of us. And while I'm wondering what this all means, there was a colonel to my left. He says, don't even try bargaining with them. They're 50 bucks a week. And I thought, 35 cents? And this is 50 bucks? <laughs> this colonel must have been making money on this or something. <laughs> But you're only there for uh, five, six days, or seven days, and we had all this money we could not spend. Was that oh, in Tokyo? Hell, it was only money. Yeah, was that in Tokyo? Or... I forgot what town it was in. And so, <clears throat> this girl takes you by the hand, and she takes you to uh, Mama-san's house, where they have kind of straw, mat straw mats. Instead of um, uh, Kleenex for cleaning up, they had something that was like wax paper. I said, wax paper? We wrap sandwiches in wax paper. And the mama sign would come in with a, like a cup of tea, close the door and open the door, which was built like out of balsa wood and tissue paper. <clears throat> and uh, the girls were very obedient and very, very, uh, Clean hygiene was a very, very big thing with the uh, Japanese girls, far more hy hygienic than American girls. And uh, she would put you in this big tub of hot water, you know, these big tubs, you know. And she jumps in, I stick my toe in and I almost burnt my toe. And she says, Come on. <clears throat> and I said, Well, you only live once. Besides, she wouldn't have anything to do with me unless I cleaned up <laughs> until yeah. I jumped in. And pretty quick, you got used to the hot water. And she had these leaves, you know, tied together, and she washed me all down. And uh, thinking, how come American girls didn't take care of us boys like this? <laughs> and then we would uh, relax and do us naturally. And then at some point, I'd want some of the... Uh, food from the American PX, and I'd give her a $20 bill, American money, to go to the uh, PX to get me a malted or candy bar or whatever, and wondered if she was going to come back with the money. I found out them gals were a lot more honest than the American girls were. and. Um, Pretty soon the week was up, and I couldn't get wait to get back to where the uh, women were reasonable, Lee Price. <laughs> <laughs> you know, interesting. Even though Korea was uh, warm, torn, no facilities for bathing. That one decent house standing in Seoul. The girls were kept themselves very clean. 
and we're very aware of um, not allowing themselves to um, become dirty or infected with anything. Yeah. I came back with the uh, <coughs> conviction <coughs> that Orientals were much more concerned about hygiene than Americans. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a postnatal drip. <coughs> So, oh, I also found while in Japan on that R and R. <clears throat> though I was used to uh, Harley Davidson and reckless driving and ring tailing and, and all that kind of stuff, the Japanese taxi drivers scared the living <laughs> heck out of me. Couldn't believe that they were drove that fast and that reckless. And I thought I was a hellion on wheels. Those Japanese drivers scared me. I'm trying to think of <clears throat> what might also be important in, uh, along those lines. Did you, uh, when you came back uh, home, did you have any interest or did it work out that you um, were able to maintain any friendships or contacts with people you met in the service or? Well, that's interesting. There was a half a dozen of us guys. We said, hey, when we're out of the Army, you know, we'll have to get together and have a, lift a few uh, drinks and talk about our experiences. And once we got out, we seemed to have no interest in those same people and gravitated back to our old friends with never a thought of um, what we promised to do. Yeah. In basic training, there was a Japanese American, really nice guy with a laid back attitude. Name was Vince. The cadre found out he was a martial arts expert and asked if he could give us a demonstration. <clears throat> and he says, okay, but one at a time. And approximately 40 of us guys lined up and came at him one at a time. And nobody was able to touch him with a kick, with a punch, with a left, with a right. And after he parried all those blows, I noticed there wasn't one bead of perspiration on his forehead. Wow. I don't know what happened to him after that, but uh, we got a little bit friendly in basic. And he told me how his brother and him have a school on South Wabash Avenue in Chicago, four, five, six hundred South, and said, listen, you know, uh, after you get out of the Army, come on in, we'll give you lessons. I said, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to afford it, Vince. He said, not to worry, I wouldn't charge you. You're okay. And so after I got out, I went down there. For about a year, on and off, I got uh, judo lessons. But the uh, monopoly wore off. And uh, later, during that time, I found his brother was an eighth degree black belt, which is as high as you can go. And uh, likewise with him. And about uh, a year ago, no, it's been, see, 1952, <clears throat> 60, <clears throat> well, 55, 60 years since I got out. You know, I thought of him a number of times. And I wondered what happened to him. Well, my friend, <coughs> being a uh, computer geek, I discussed it with her. Well, she located a judo school in uh, Washington, which referred me to a jiu-jitsu school in Wyoming, which referred her to a judo school in Dallas, Texas, which 
He said, yes, they know of him and he lives here. I said, boy, I appreciate his phone number. They said, listen, he has hundreds of people that would like to talk to him and I can't give out his name. I said, listen, tell you what, you tell them who I am, the things we talked about, and uh, he may want to talk to me. And within the hour, he called me. Oh, they said, okay, here's his phone number, you can call him. And uh, so we talked for about an hour. And uh, he's on dialysis, goes three times a week. And I thought, boy, how unfair life is. This guy was so capable, such a smooth judo artist. And uh, this is what he ends up with. He lives in Dallas, goes for dialysis. And uh, I gather he's a little bit too sick to talk too often. So I only talked to him that time for about uh, 45 minutes. And I uh, didn't want to call him again. I thought it would be uh, somewhat of a bother. Since he has hundreds, if not more, yeah. people wanting to communicate with him, and he's not too well. He told me in basic training how uh, he and his family were in uh, detention camps in uh, Wyoming, or thereabouts, <clears throat> and how they would get uh, weekend passes sometimes. And five, six, seven of his buddies would go into a local town, and the local guys would assault him, calling him goose and Japanese. And so they got beat up. Well, a few weeks goes by, they got a pass, they went into town again. And the local toughs would assault him again. And put a pound of lumps on him. Well, when they got back to camp, they decided, though the authorities don't like Japs, you know, during World War II, the climate was against them, they're not going to take this beating up anymore. They're going to fight back. And this is coming from a guy who has a really laid back attitude. He said, they decide they're not going to get beat up again. So they went to the town the third time, and a gang of toughs assaulted him. He said, Sam, I kid you not, in about uh, two and a half minutes, seven guys were on the ground with uh, broken limbs. He says, you know, they didn't bother us again. Now, if I was able to do that, I would laugh and stick out my chest, and I would feel <clears throat> very proud of my exploits, but he was just the opposite. He, he re regretted that he, they had to do this. Very respectful, very laid back attitude. I can tell he wished so bad that they didn't have to break those guys' bones. Yeah. So we talked a lot, him and I, we seemed to get uh, closer in basic training. And so that's why after 60 years, I oftentimes thought of him and looked him up about a year ago and talked to him and found out he has kidney uh, condition and is on dialysis three times a week. And boy, he was just a nice guy. And if I had a third kidney, I would certainly give it to him. Yeah. Um. Mr. Schechter, how do you think your military service and your experiences in the military may have affected your life? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it certainly did hurt me. And it uh, gave me a little more wider experience. Made me, I think, a little bit more worldly. It taught me a little bit more about different kinds of people and being a little more responsible. And that the world didn't revolve just around me. I think it was a worthwhile experience. And though I didn't, when I was in, after I was out, 
I came to realize I enjoyed it. Yeah. Do you think your experience in the military um, influenced your thinking about war or about armies or armed forces or? <clears throat> Well, I uh, found out that a lot of the information we got was not true. As an example, I read in <clears throat> Stars and Stripes and in a paper I got from, uh, was sent to me from back home in Chicago, a big battle took place at uh, this particular spot in Korea. We killed 50,000 Chinese and destroyed uh, umpteen uh, tanks and trucks, and I looked at the map, zeroed in, I said, you know guys, it's just nine miles from here. Now we jumped into the three-quarter ton and out we went. Trees were standing, the grass was all green. I asked some of the locals, where was this battle? That was battle, what are you talking about? So, you know, I learned not to believe everything the Stars and Stripes told us like killing 100,000 Chinese in this battle and 50,000 Chinese in another battle, but no battle there ever really took place. I'm sure you want to record this? Oh, no, this is, this is, certainly do. See, I was a motor sergeant. I can come and go whenever I want. And I went all over and I talked to, unlike uh, Iraq, I walked myself with my carbine slung around my shoulder into a great number of South Korean villages and towns. Never meeting hostile people. I never worried that a sniper might be picking me off. Probably because I was young and foolish and thinking nothing could hurt, no, no that was gonna hurt me. And so I uh, really went all over and they had little shops all over selling kimonos and things like this. And even though I didn't need it, I enjoyed inter I enjoyed uh, interacting with the people. I enjoyed socializing with them. I enjoyed bargaining with them. If they wanted, <clears throat> I think we got 360 yen for the dollar. If they wanted. 90 yen for a scarf or something. I'd enjoy bargaining them, chewing them down to maybe 40 yen, though I really didn't want it. And uh, I enjoyed the, uh, oh, what would you call it? Uh, socializing, maybe? Yeah. And so you found the Korean people were um, <coughs> not hostile at all. Not hostile at all. <coughs> and uh, oh yes, one day I'm in Seoul. <coughs> I found this old mama-san. That's an old lady. She's sitting on the sidewalk, back up against the building, selling uh, pencils for some money. Looked very poor. And just when I was coming up upon her, I'm going to drop some yen into her lap, there was a South Korean National Police, real son of the bitches they were. They reminded me of the German Gestapo of wow. World War II. Tall black boots, black pants, <clears throat> tall. And he stopped, <clears throat> looked at her, and he barked conversation at her, which of course I didn't understand, probably insulting her, telling her to get off the sidewalk, and she should be ashamed of herself and all this, and then gave her a kick in her legs. Oh, I felt so bad about that, how that son of a bitch yeah. <clears throat> kicked that poor old defenseless woman. And I had no authority over him, but he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I looked at him. 
And I think if I wasn't there staring at him, he might have worked that old lady over more. And so he just continued walking down the sidewalk. And I thought, you rotten son of a bitch, kicking that poor old Korean lady in the legs like that. And so I dropped her a bunch of yen in her lap. <clears throat> Maybe five, six, seven hundred yen, which I think was about 360 to the American dollar. Another thing I resented, every payday, we come into our officer's tent, and the captain would have a <clears throat> bucket there, American Red Cross, and he'd look at me like, as we got our check, I was, we got our uh, script. They didn't get us military down. script, script, yeah. And I'd say, Captain, you know, <clears throat> this is no good. And he indicated, unless he got donations from the troops, it reflected badly on him. So I dropped a buck in there. And another reason I didn't want to give to the Red Cross. Because of all the freedom I had, I used to see American Red Cross ladies driving around in new American station wagons with majors and colonels next to them. And the scuttlebutt that was going around, they were getting $100 a night. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot of money now, but it was then. And that they, uh, them gals went back with a lot of money. How they got brand new American station wagons to ride around with is beyond me. And um, they, of course, wouldn't look at us uh, non-commissioned officers, uh, non-commissioned uh, guys. <coughs> they wouldn't even talk to us. <coughs> It seemed pretty obvious they were intent on making money. Even at the USO shows, there was never any uh, Red Cross workers there. Never got a cup of coffee. We got off the ship in San Francisco. There was a Salvation Army. They had coffee and donuts for us. I said, where's the Red Cross? Nobody ever seen any Red Cross workers. And many of my fellow soldiers, we, like me, <coughs> we didn't rate those, uh, that Red Cross operation uh, very highly. If it was up to me, I would have banned them from the whole of Korea, because I couldn't see one bit of good they did, except get rich. To this day, I always drop something into uh, the kettles of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, <coughs> other one. Salvation. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I have, uh, I'm pushing 79, so once in a while I get a little senior moment. <laughs> <clears throat> and, um, yeah, I really, uh, have a bad feeling in my uh, gut about those uh, Red Cross workers. And, um, you know, they flew us back from uh, California to, um, I forgot exactly what camp, it could have been uh, Fort McCoy. Mid-route, I started to get uh, chills and fever, alternating chills and fever. And uh, I guess I was looking pretty bad. So the stewardess told the pilot to land you know, somewhere mid-route, a little dirt earth field. Then I seen an ambulance pulling up. Just then, a feeling of well-being came over me. I refused to get off the plane and the plane took off again. Well, later on, I found out uh, it was a touch of uh, malaria. 
And what made me mad, I had 30 day leave, I believe. <clears throat> Half of those 30 days, I was homesick with what appeared to be malaria, hot and cold uh, chills. Half the time. I'd go out with the guys and all that. After two or three days, geez, I got chills, I got fever. I ended up back home. Never went to the VA. And then, when I was due to get back to camp after a 30 day leave, disgustingly I returned to health. <laughs> I never had a touch of what I think was malaria again. And so I've been, except for that one touch, I've been very uh, healthy all my life. And you're going to laugh at this, but I sometimes wonder if it wasn't for the fact when I was 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, me and my buddies, we used to swim in the Chicago River when it was really a sewer. It smelled like a sewer. And everything imaginable would be floating down the river. We must have been pretty stupid. But we, uh, we swam in that river. And we did scuba diving in that river. Wow. And you know what? Nobody ever got sick. And all those guys and myself never contacted anything and we're healthy and strong the rest of our lives. <coughs> Knock on wood. I think as a layman I probably contacted all this disease but having a healthy body built up an immunity to it. Consequently we never contacted anything the rest of our lives. We had to be pretty stupid to swim in that stupid um, Chicago yeah, River. Nowadays, I think if you fall in the river, they want to take you to the... Uh, oh, nowadays, it's... <clears throat> it's 300% um, cleaner than it was... Uh, I would imagine, yeah. When I got out of the Army, <clears throat> I had the GI Bill coming. And I... Uh, Because of the uh, friends I had, I never thought about going back to school. Since some of my friends were flying, I took fl uh, flying lessons under the GI Bill. And you might say, uh, flew it away. And for a couple of years, I just uh, flew around from one airport to the next and played around with airplanes and repaired airplanes and with uh, my Harley Davidson motorcycles and um, kind of that kind of life. Long before those movies about the wild ones and these motors and the Hells Angels and people like that, and before there was a word called hippies, uh, we were doing all these things that just uh, we didn't know what we were. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, people in those days had a bad view of motorcycle riders due to all the uh, existing propaganda. So we were kind of looked upon as a uh, motley lot, as somebody uh, to avoid. But uh, we weren't really bad. We were just out for enjoyment. We never hurt anybody. We never thought we were very tough. We just liked to ride, trail ride, go through the woods, swim, look for girls to ravish and all that, which is, you know, all guys want. <laughs> and then, well, finally, We got our belly full and settled down a while, which was normal. Then we began to grow up and began to concentrate on more growing up things. But getting back to the uh, military. Yeah, if there's anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered. <clears throat> And when I was in, they must have been taking everybody. 
because they almost got killed twice in basic training. They are lined up like uh, 40 guys on one line and 40 on an opposing line. And we're supposed to have bayonet practice. And I looked at the guy confronting me and I said, Sam, he looks like he's got crazy eyes. And we're supposed to launch and you parry the blow and then, you know, you launch and he parries the blow. And you make sure you're not going to stick anybody with the bayonet. When I looked at this guy, and I knew something was wrong. He launched at me, and if I wasn't fast, stepped out of the way, he would have ran me right through. I ran up to the cadre and says, I ain't staying next to this guy, he's nuts. They were taking everybody at the time. There was one guy, he's, uh, the glasses that he had looked like the bottoms of uh, milk bottles. Um, <clears throat> then we had this night problem. Cadre was up on this hill, and we're going up the hill, firing our blanks, and they're firing blanks down at us to simulate an assault on a hill. And all of a sudden, I hear a bang, and my helmet blows off my head. I turn and I look, and there's this dummy with the milk bottles, eyes. He fires his gun. Good thing it was a blank, fired it right into my head. We had real ammunition, I would have been dead twice. The obstacle course, the filtration course, embarrassed me. I thought the Boy Scouts really did tougher things. Which I think gets back to what I had read at the time. American Army says we need warm bodies over there and we need them quick. So they took everybody. The training I had, I learned more about firing guns and knives and driving and mechanics much more than I ever learned in basic training. Frankly, the military ain't going to like this. This is training? I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. My girlfriend could have done all this stuff where we had in basic training with one hand. Really? Really. You had to get up at like 6 o'clock in the morning and run five miles with a pack on your back or something or crawl on your stomach through the brush? Or... It was kind of child's play. Oh. Yeah. I used to think, well, let me tell you something a little more important. We're in Korea, and my company commander is a, you know, kind of discreet are lurking around the khaki service office in the rear. Uh, take a few guys and go on a patrol. And we were the, we were not, in my opinion, we were not soldiers. I'd go, I'd take the men, we'd go on the first hill out of sight, the company headquarters, and there's a vast, flat expanse of land. If you had a cigarette in your mouth, you would see that cigarette four miles away. And these guys are coughing and lighting cigarettes and farting and blowing their nose. And I says, guys, if there's some enemy out here, we're dead. And um, there it is, <clears throat> midnight, and it's real quiet. And this buddy next to me starts coughing. Oh, God. I says, you know what? I ain't going any further. These guys are going to get me killed. <clears throat> we dug a hole, three foot hole, four foot hole. And I climbed in, we climbed in that hole, and we had these half a tent, a, a shelter half, or whatever they call it. I put it over the hole. I stayed in that hole with these guys for a half hour, 40 minutes. I peeked out, didn't see nothing, and then slid back down the hill to company headquarters. I wasn't going on patrol with those guys. 
I grew up with a pretty sneaky bunch of guys. <laughs> and so I know these guys, you know, had milk bottles in their eyes and all that. We're not one to go on patrol yeah. with. You know what I used to think? These guys were so unsoldier like. I used to think, you know, six guys from my old crowd formed into a unit. We'd be able to go around and annihilate one service, one service outfit after the other, eliminate everybody without never incurring any damage to ourselves. They were that sneaky, and the guys I was in was so untrained and unsoldier-like. Yeah. Were you from a particular neighborhood in Chicago, the old neighborhood? Was it North uh, Avenue, California. North of California. I used to think, I don't think you want to record this. I used to think, this is an army? Yeah. Half a dozen guys from my neighborhood, we wipe out all these guys. <laughs> they, um, they were, uh, A couple of the guys were, uh, I don't know where they got the stuff, or they were on drugs. And uh, one guy we called Beepop because he was, he never knew what was going on, he was Beepopping. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, believe me, they were not soldiers. I was not going to go on a patrol with them. I would go myself if I had to, I wouldn't go with them. And uh, as far as being in good physical shape, not at all. I don't think any of them were ever in a fight. Half of them are, in my opinion, still tied to their mother's apron strings. And one guy definitely was. He used to holler at us guys, you're going to get disease, you know, going on with these girls. And you, um, you're insulting your um, mother. <clears throat> what would your mother say? <clears throat> one day, he really was a sweet, nice kid, clean cut, as they come. <clears throat> I got this most beautiful Korean girl, gave her a bath, shower, we gave her extra money, and it was like 8, 9 o'clock at night, we put her in this sleeping bag, and we said, no matter what he says, you do not get out of that sleeping bag. If you're in that sleeping bag in the morning, I'm going to give you mucho Juan. Juan was their money. <laughs> so we're all in our bunks. And in comes it. Should I mention his name? In comes it. Okay, Emmerich. Still remember his last name. And we're waiting to hear him screaming and yelling and kicking her out. And, and we're waiting. And we're waiting. Pretty soon we all fell asleep. <laughs> We get up in the morning and there he is with a big uh, grin, silly grin on his face, you know. We created a monster after that every day. Guys, let's go to town, get some girls. Come on, guys. I say, Amber, Amber, take it easy. You know, you can't go well with this kind of stuff, you know. And, Come on, let's go get some girls. Come on, get, get the vehicle. I say, Amber, please. And these guys said, Sam, you created a monster. He's going to get back home. His mother's going to say, what did the army do to him? <laughs> that was his first encounter with a female. <laughs> I wonder if he's being interviewed. <laughs> well, that's, so I don't know, that's quite a story. I don't know how much you... Uh, I can tell you some other things I did over there, but I don't know. Well, I think we, uh, we no, got the flavor. We got the flavor, I think. Uh, I uh, I liked explosions. I liked shooting, and I used to go in our uh, supply room and gather up a whole arm load of <coughs> carbines and hand grenades and thousands of rounds of ammunition. And I used to target practice. I liked it. And uh, when one gun, the stock was smoking, I throw it on the side and grab the other one. It'd make beer cans jump up and down, and throw hand grenades, and, and one day. I come in the supply room, I open up this big chest, and he says, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. 
we almost had nothing left there in case we ever attacked. <laughs> all that, nothing left to defend ourselves. And I used to think, oh my God, forever attacked. We're all going to run for this ammunition and guns. We're going to be nothing there. And we're all going to be wiped out. And then a court martial are going to say, what did you do with everything? Yeah. I said, so right away, I went to Ordnance Ammo with a couple of cards of cigarettes. And I got a whole catch of uh, guns and ammunition again and refilled our supply room. So, it's kind of what I mean. Kind of like an experience. Kind of like an like experience. Like motorcycle riding and, you know, maybe yeah. you guys are, uh, you're only limited by your own imagination. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good statement. Yeah. And then I got a tent. And uh, before we just had a hole in the ground. Well, then I uh, made a box, which was like a toilet. Then I requisitioned, acquired a tent. So I put this tent up, and we had a, uh, a toilet now, a washroom, uh, a toilet, you know, with a tent, with a box, and a hole in the ground. And uh, again, you're only limited by your own imagination. And I used to secure a lot, uh, you know, I won't go into that. A lot of things from my company commander, who was a doctor, really nice guy. And, uh, you know, there was really <clears throat> almost everything available. It's just a matter of how much you wanted something, how persistent, and how determined you are. I guess the same thing works in civilian life. It just depends on yeah. the you want something. Yeah. I have to get another tape. <laughs> yeah, Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'll be right back, sir. Yeah. It's uh, 3.25. See, this, this recorder is still going, the digital. We can do about 10 hours on <laughs> that. But the tapes, I think, are... Uh, 30, 90 minutes. Yeah, 90 minutes. So when I get to... Uh, Okay, we're back in business on the second paper. So, after training, they gave me a ticket to California. I could have went on a troop train, but I managed to get a civilian ticket. And I think it was Camp Stoneman. And you know what? I found girls over there, too. 
<clears throat> okay. I had a sixth sense <laughs> where to search for girls. <clears throat> so, after that, we got to uh, Japan. And we got into a, uh, a camp. I guess it was built for uh, Japanese troops. And it wasn't used for a long time because everything was dusty. And I said, okay, you guys, <clears throat> you've got to clean up this uh, whole barracks here. Well, I thought that was kind of beneath me. <clears throat> I'm going over to Korea, and now they're going to pick me to work cleaning. So I uh, mosey out. What are they going to do to me? I'm going to Korea. Are they going to put me in the guardhouse? You know. <clears throat> so I moseyed around, and I uh, see the cyclone fence at the uh, edge of the camp. And there's this beautiful Japanese girl smiling at me. So I actually gravitate over there. She motions me about 20 feet away, and there was a big hole in the cyclone fence. So I walk over there, and I see 15, 20 Japanese, pretty Japanese girls laying on beautiful blankets. And there was this Japanese guard. What a, he had a gun, I don't know if it was loaded. He's marching the perimeter. <laughs> and I said to this girl, she says, okay, okay, you don't have to worry. <clears throat> So I climb through this fence, and um, I see this Japanese guard <laughs> looking back. You know, and uh, so there I was with her on this uh, beautiful, uh, colorful blanket. I'm getting uh, initiation into Japan. So I go back. I call my buddies. Come on, you guys. They said, no, we're getting in trouble. Come on. So I brought another 10, 15 guys over. I'll go through the fence. And girls ended up with a lot of business. And then, uh, so we go back to the barracks. And some officer comes back in about four or five hours. He looks, looks like nothing was done here. What are you guys doing? I said, Sarge, some beautiful girls outside the cycle fence. <laughs> he turned around and walked out. He wasn't going to argue with us. And so, girls are all over. You just got to know where to look. <laughs> Yeah, um, my first initiation to uh, girls in Korea, second, third day in Korea, oh, I'm in Seoul, and I look at, across the street, the street was um, a dirt road, I think, and two pretty girls, I'm looking at them, because they're pretty, and I ain't seen a girl, I had one for a few days. And I was shocked. She picks up her dress, squats, and urinated. I said, wow, never see that back home. And then four or five, uh, <clears throat> four or five days later, <clears throat> I went to this uh, river to take a swim. <clears throat> and there was Korean women on both sides of the river doing their clothes with a flat board, pounding the clothes out of flat rocks, no soap. And there was about 25 guys in this river, completely in the nude, up to their knees washing. And I thought, wow, all in the nude in front of maybe a few hundred women in this river couldn't have been more than uh, 50 feet wide. I thought, wow. You know, within a couple days I was doing the same thing and never thought anything of it. And uh, when they, uh, by the way, uh, washed those clothes as I described, they smelled fresher than any clothes we wash here in washing machines with soap. It smelled like the river. It smelled like the fresh air. And then later on, I would get a whole barracks bag of uh, my clothes washed by these mamasans for a uh, bar of uh, soap, a big bar of soap, a um, Hershey bar. And because I was so big-hearted, big -hearted, 
I flip her um, what amounts to a quarter in American money. And she was just overjoyed. She called me the big spender. The last of the big spenders. I felt sorry for them. Yeah. And the money we had meant nothing to, uh, to me. And everything was so cheap. And they desperately needed help. And instead of giving it to their Red Cross, and those uh, charlatans, I felt better giving it to those poor old local mama sons. <clears throat> and then I, uh, well, let's see. Maybe you want to shut that off for a moment? Sure. Allow me to collect my thoughts. Yes. Yep. This treaty, the Chinese prisoners, terribly. And they were, um, you want me to record that? Yeah. And the Orientals, the Chinese prisoners, the soldiers, to me, they looked like they were like maybe 15. But I come to realize that um, they just look a lot younger. They were maybe like us, 18, 19, but they look young to us. <clears throat> and these African Americans, <clears throat> African Americans, had these three Chinese, what looked like really young kids, on the hood of their Jeep. And they were, and our, they were, our, our guys were so tall. And these Chinese were so small and innocent looking. And they got them on the hood of this Jeep and they'd go down the road like 20 miles an hour, slam on the brakes, <clears throat> and these three Chinese would slide off. Then they'd get out there and they would yell, <laughs> this kind of crap. And of course I had no authority over them. And then they'd make those Chinese get out to the hood of the Jeep again. And then go down the road 20 miles an hour and slam on the brakes. And the Chinese would slide off the hood of the vehicle again. And they would get out there. <clears throat> and these American soldiers of ours, <clears throat> soldiers, would show these poor little defenseless Chinese prisoners what great, big, tough American soldiers they were. They kick them, punch them around, and throw them back on the hood of the Jeep. And I lost uh, sight of what happened after that. That really made me mad. <clears throat> I discussed it with my company commander. He said, just to forget it. some swimming holes in Korea. Beautiful, nice little swimming holes. The type Americans pay a few thousand dollars to go visit. Make great resorts today. And in one of these places, I found that, uh, we found a couple of uh, chain, a couple of Korean babies. They had uh, maggots stuffed in their eyes, in their mouth, and their ears. And I understand that uh, when the people felt they were unable to take care of their children, they, uh, they did this. Why they didn't just drown them or shoot them or whatever, I don't know. But they were stuffed with uh, maggots. Or maybe just abandoned and the maggots just happened. I'm not sure which. Well, one of my guys said, well, let's take them back to uh, the hospital. I said, look. If the people wanted to abandon the child, you know what? That's their prerogative. I don't think we should interfere. Well, a couple of the guys I was with said, no, 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 you, you can't destroy a life like this. And so we took the uh, two kids back to <clears throat> where they could get treatment. I don't know if they got treatment. I don't know what happened to them. And then, <clears throat> a 
drove into Sewell a number of times. And to my surprise, uh, it was chock full of able-bodied men walking around, civilians, at least in civilian clothes. And I thought to myself, why are we here, brought in from America, when, look, Sewell, tens of thousands of able-bodied Koreans walking around here as civilians. And uh, that was interesting. And then on a couple of these trips into Seoul, I had some Koreans approach me very nicely. Listen, can we uh, steal your truck? We're willing to give you X amount of uh, money. Because when we, I went to Seoul, I chained up the vehicle to a lamppost. And I decided against, uh, I didn't need no money. I didn't like money. I didn't need money to have fun in Korea or back home. Some of the best times of my life. Never had a dime in my pocket. When you get a situation like that, your mind works on a different plane or something like that. So a couple of times I was offered uh, money to let them don't lock the, the lock and so they can steal the vehicle. Uh, but uh, I didn't go for that. Maybe if they offered me their sister, it might have been different. <laughs> and uh, again, full of able-bodied men walking around. And they had to take us 20-year-old kids from the States and bring us here to fight. Many of these Koreans were bigger, stronger looking than we were. Uh, Interesting. And then, uh, <clears throat> I've seen such terrible waste. The, uh, the parking lots, as far as the eye could see, just loaded with trucks and tanks <clears throat> and planes and they used to think, oh my gosh, it staggered the imagination. And I had an imagination at that time. They used to think, who could ever use all this equipment? One day I'm walking around in my company <clears throat> area <clears throat> near the 38 parallel, maybe thirty miles behind the front line. And there's a strange guy walking around. I said, Hey, who are you? Well, he's a pilot and he is stationed at this uh, airport that's about fifteen miles to our, our rear. I says, oh, uh -huh, that's nice. Uh, what do you fly? I think he says was, they were called L-19s. Uh, metal uh, body plane, metal. Not the Irish linen that light planes were made out of at the time. He said, would you like to fly with me sometime? I said, sure. Me and my big mouth. Because I'll tell you what happened next. <clears throat> And I'm flying around with him, and I'm looking down, and I'm seeing white <clears throat> explosions, flashes of white. I said, hey, what's that? He says, they're firing at us. I said, who? He said, the enemy. I said, where are we at? He says, over enemy territory. I'm a spotter. Oh, my gosh. Another time I didn't have my thinking cap on. I expected a bullet to come flying underneath this plane and right into my rear end. And I says, if they're firing at us, why are we flying around here? They're about to hit us. I didn't get an answer that I remember. I says, how long are we going to be over this enemy territory? Well, not long. 
I said, I sure hope so. Listen, guy, I gotta tell you, I'm scared of getting a bullet up my rear end. He didn't answer. And I don't know how long we were over enemy territory, but I was sodden needles and pins. Because this place had this plane had, you know, thin metal skin, you know. Uh, finally we turned around and we headed back. We landed. I got out of the plane, I didn't even say goodbye to him. <laughs> that guy never told me where we were going. Who was I mad at him? <clears throat> Let me tell you, after that, I made sure I kept my thinking cap on. <clears throat> and then, uh, that might have been how I got into flying. And then when I get, was stationed at Fort McCoy, I met a couple of uh, local guys. They had a Piper Cub on their farm. You can look through one side and see the other. It was uh, uh, linen is what they covered those light planes with at the time. And on the fuselage, the body, the plane, half of it was missing. And they says, well, you like to take a ride with us? I was still in uniform. I said, wait a minute, look at this plane. It's got holes all over it. I said, that's okay. That's not important. It's the wings. It's the wings that they can fly. I didn't see any holes in the wings. So I went up with them. And it's true, you know. You don't need any uh, covering on the fuselage. All you need is the wings and the engine. And then we flew around. And then, uh, so that's another reason I think I... Uh, started flying under the GI Bill and uh, you know the memories don't come so quick after uh, 55 years 1950. I, I think you have an amazing uh, treasure trove of memories. <laughs> I guess a good joke. Oh, you guys, that's a great, uh, great story. I have, I have two questions. I think um, the the pictures that you brought in today, uh, that's taken. That's not an order. See, no smoking. I'm smoking. Yeah. I never take orders very well. Yeah, that's me. So you never thought of making a career of the army then or anything. Or? Uh, you'd have to take orders. It was too regimented of a life. It did not provide enough freedom for me. Yeah. Now this picture, you're here with um, three other <coughs> yeah. soldiers. And this is me. Yeah, second from the And uh, This guy was a mechanic, but lazy. I find I was uh, in charge. I find him laying underneath the truck. Yeah. And I said, why don't you get to work? You know, I don't like to work. I'm the type of guy that likes to get all the work done. Ah, now I can be lazy. Yeah. So I have a guilty conscience. Yeah. I do whatever I want. Yeah. But some people, they just like to drag it out, drag it out. And I used to say, I thought I almost had his name. <clears throat> Come on, why don't you get the job done? Get done. As we get all this work done, so we can do whatever we want after that. Yeah. And so I always... That's the first guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think these guys were truck drivers. Okay. And this is in this is in Korea. Oh yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, this is a motor pool, a tent. And yeah, we've got to bring the vehicles in there. Yeah. The the other question that occurs this to me. A gas can. Yeah. The other question that occurs to me is, you mentioned about um, the guys from the old neighborhood. What a unit! What a unit they would have constituted on a, on a field. They were deadly. Did any of them have to go in the service, and how did they do? Yeah. Many of them did end up in the service, drafted like me. Most of them ended up in prison. <laughs> One guy was in, uh, sent to Germany. He ended up in Heidelberg prison. Oh. He tried to hijack an um, uh, army truck loaded with supplies and sell it. Another guy. And they were a real uh, mutinous crew. They uh, very entrepreneurish. Mm -hmm. Uh, another guy, he uh, was thrown out under Section 8, means undesirable. <laughs> another guy, <clears throat> let's see what happened to him. <clears throat> they, none of them made good army material. 
the way the army was set up. But if we could have been set up in one special group, we would have been deadly. Cabot the Dirty Dozen? Yeah, I think that it comes to mind, yeah. Uh, well, that's an example. <coughs> one of my buddies, old buddies, named Kepi. Now, in certain neighborhoods, three-story buildings were separated, only had maybe about a two-and-a-half-foot walk between them. Yeah. When he put his feet on one building and on the other, and with his hands, he'd go all the way up to the third, third flight and hold himself there with his feet, get a piece of pie, the one that puts on the windowsill, Sam, are you ready? I said, yeah. He started by. <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of exercise uh, I and my buddies were used to. And, uh, yeah, and, and nobody I, I was with in basic training uh, was able to do those things. I was able to walk a <clears throat> rope a hundred feet across the river and all that kind of stuff. And no sooner guys got onto this rope, they were too creepy to drop into the river or on the ground, you know, the uh, very bad army material. But like I said, they were taking everybody because they needed warm bodies in Korea. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, the other guy, uh, let's see, he was meant to. You see, what the military, I think, ought to do is like a sharp <clears throat> manager or a sharp a C, a CP, a sharp um, <clears throat> guy ahead of a, a company. You find out the specific, specific thing that person can do. Don't give him a job that is not suited for him. Everybody knows something. Everybody's good at something. And you find out where he's best suited, and that, I think, is what would make a good army. Yeah. I had one that told me, you remember being in line, and the guy in front of him was a fireman, and they made a truck driver out of him. The next guy in line was a truck driver, and they made a fireman out of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to... <clears throat> when I told you that officer set up that table in the middle of that road, he was asking everybody what they did. And uh, those who did nothing worthwhile went to the left lane, and those who had some worthwhile went to the right. Well, I had my thinking cap on. I couldn't think of what they wanted. I just saw trucks and pulled them out of the truck and they came. And some of those guys, by the way, which I uh, went to the line on the left, they were wrapped up like core wood. I saw some of them about. Uh, a month and a half later, they were stacked up like a uh, core wood outside some uh, officer's tent. And I was on the uh, front there, I forgot why. But I was a real, like I said, nosy guy. I always uh, moving around and uh, always looking for uh, adventure, always looking for new things, and always uh, trying to find out what's going on. and. Uh, so I used to see a lot of these things, and I used to think, gosh, these poor guys, 21 years old, 20, they didn't know from nothing. They don't know what the world's all about. They don't know where Korea's on the map. They didn't even care. They didn't know that South Korea, and this is controversial. We were there defending South Korea, but they were ruled by a guy named Sigmund Rhee who was a bloodthirsty dictator and killed tens of thousands of his own people. You know about Sigmund Rhee? Oh, you do. Well, I'll give you one. And of course, that's, <clears throat> that's one South Korean soldier attached to my outfit. He used to say, oh, he's probably dead now, I'm sure, but we call him, I call him Rufus. He used to say, Pretty soon, Sigmund Rhee going to die, and then we go to have peace. And uh, it was obvious what he meant. And the people, South Koreans, we supposedly were fighting for, 
didn't like their Sigmund Reed and didn't like their national police, which I previously mm -hmm. told you about. They were ruled by the Sigmund Rhee bloody dictatorship who used to put people into tiger cages and then spread lie on, on them and sit and listen to them in agony. And that's why when the North Koreans attacked the Chinese, uh, the South Koreans, South Koreans uh, quickly would throw off their uniforms I and mean, resort to being civilians because they didn't want to fight for the people we were there to help, which was Sigmund Reed and his cronies. You really want to record this? It's the soldiers, it's the soldiers' view of, of this the was during the McCarthy era, 1950-52. Yeah, they'd probably be looking me up. Yeah. How this communist get into the army? <laughs> But I can only tell you what the uh, these Korean soldiers told me. Yeah. And I always meant, I said, Rufus, I'm going to come back someday. I'm going to look you up. And then, yeah, he says, you won't come back. I was 21. He was like uh, 45. I thought he was an old man. <laughs> 45. Here I am. Yeah. 78. And I thought 45 was an old man. And I was. And I would have long, gone back to visit, but... I lost his address, you know, motorcycle riding and all that kind of stuff. And nothing has uh, settled him. I was lucky I didn't lose my pants in those days. So I never, so I did I lose track of him. And you know what I thought? You know, he was nicer and I had a better chemistry with him than I did with all my uncles and aunts. This is the Korean. Korean. This is the Korean gentleman, yeah. So I guess that's what they mean when they say sometimes a friend can be a much better friend than you know, family. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a uh, real good relationship. One time he says, uh, <coughs> how would you like to visit my uh, brother? And I don't know of any other American soldiers that had a relationship with uh, Korean soldiers. And I says, uh, okay, Rufus, uh, well, it's about 50 miles this way. He had a flat face, flat, you know, like my, uh, like the Mongolians, you know. Yeah, face, kind yeah. Of. But what a gentle, nice person. <coughs> now I'm wondering, <coughs> is he a, uh, an enemy in disguise? You know, where's he taking me? Yeah. They're on take him cheap and I said, Rufus, uh, you know, we got a lot of shit here. And thinking, you know, the Koreans are starving, they don't have anything. Said, take some food, anything? So take some blanket. Nothing. He said, Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> so we drive down to his brother. He had uh, a very respectful Obedient, clean wife, three nice little children. I think the oldest was about six or seven. And I had my M1 carbine. I didn't want to appear like a threat. I didn't want to leave myself defenseless because I'm still not so sure about what's going on. And I, uh, I took the uh, ammo out of my carving and laid it up against the wall so nobody could pick it up and shoot me. I took the ammo out of it. And I did that to show them that I'm no threat to them. And I go to sit down <coughs> and, mama and his wife comes and she wipes off the chair real nice, you know. Well, to make a long story short, and they gave me food, kimchi. And this is hard to describe, but they had a refined culture I never saw in America. You know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. They were so courteous and so respectful. They were, I don't know, I'd say, 
Today, the hippies might call them beautiful people, but um, very respectful, very nice, very courteous. And I says, oh my gosh, I come to realize I'm a slob compared to these people. I am crude, I am coarse. I never realized how, <clears throat> how crude that I am. Have you met these people? And I said to myself, Sam, this could be an awakening for you. You really must uh, refine yourself. And so we had this kimchi. I was a little not used to that kind of food. So I just ate a little bit, pushed it away. They kind of laughed at me. They figured, you know, I'm a GI, you know. And they figured I wouldn't be able to eat the food. And uh, we had a nice visit. And uh, Rufus, he thanked me for taking him to visit his brother and family. And uh, we drove back to uh, company headquarters. And Rufus used to say, uh, oh, then he also told me about the Korean National Police. Sons of bitches. They murder people. They torture Koreans. Uh, they're son of a bitches and all that. And I'd say, Rufus, aren't you worried about talking to me like this? Aren't you worried that I might tell somebody what you said? No, he says, you are different from the other GIs. I know I could trust you. He was right. Yeah, they were ruled by a bloody dictator, and we went over to keep him in power. Same thing in uh, Vietnam. Vietnam was ruled by a uh, bloody dictator named, uh, <clears throat> forgot his name. And they went through one bloody dictator after the, uh, after the next. Who, again, murdered and tortured, uh, from what I hear and read, thousands of his own people. Which is why we all read stories how the South Vietnamese Army was not much of a fighting force. When the North Koreans approached, like the Koreans, they ripped off their uniforms and deserted. So we, of course, were there because we were crazy about communists in those days. We were really paranoid on communists. And I had friends who used to say, you know, Sam, better red than dead. I say, wait a minute, if you're dead, you can never change the system. What are you talking about? Did you ever hear that? Better red than dead? Boy, America was so brainwashed <clears throat> in the late 40s and early 50s. So what do you mean better red than dead? So what's the matter with a red girl? <laughs> it's all the same. <laughs> You strike me as somebody who could appreciate a good joke. Sure. Should I turn this uh... Uh, to you? There's two dogs, a Great Dane and a, a small a toy terrier at the veterinarian office. And the Great Dane says to the little toy terrier, are you here to be put to sleep? And the toy terrier says, yeah, let me tell you, my master's kids got kind of rough with me and I accidentally bit one, so they sent me here to be put to sleep. So the toy terrorist says to Great Dane, and uh, you you here to be put to sleep? Great Dane says, well, let me tell you, it's a little bit of a story. My master is a female, beautiful woman. She's walking around in the nude, then decides to uh, clean the bathtub and leans over. And I looked at that, and I just lost it. Oh, so that's why she sent you here to be put to sleep. Huh? He says, nah, get my nails clipped. <laughs> That's one of those misdirection jokes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> there, uh, <clears throat> you want me to keep talking? No, that's fine, that's fine. 
like religious jokes? Oh, do they relate to the? Do they relate to to, to Korean? Okay. Sure. <clears throat> this rabbi, the priest, are going to go golfing. Priest says, the second thought, rabbi, it's such a nice day. Uh, even though it's such a nice day, I got too many people coming in for confession. I don't think I'm going to be able to go. Rabbi says, oh, hey, gosh, what a shame. It's such a nice day. He says, tell you what, you get in one confessional box, I'll get in the other, and we'll take care of the people twice as quick, and we'll have time to go golfing. The rabbi says, yeah, but people come in for confession? I don't know what to say. He says, not to worry. It's all written inside the box. Somebody comes in and says they stole the car, you look, uh, 13 Hail Marys. Uh, somebody comes in and says they murdered somebody, you look on the list, uh, 44 Holy Marys. The rabbi says, okay. The rabbi gets in the confessional box, somebody comes in and says, <coughs> I, uh, I beat up my wife, he looks down the list. Uh, six Hail Marys. Somebody comes in and says, I uh, <clears throat> uh, stole the car. Everybody looks, ah, stealing car. Uh, 19 holy, uh, Hail Marys. Next guy comes in and says, just got a blowjob. Rabbi looks down the list, nothing under that. Just then he sees two altar boys going by. He opens the door, he says, hey kids, what do you get for blowjobs around here? They said, a cook and a Hershey bar. <laughs> <laughs> That came about, you know, with all these priests you know, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. abusing uh, people. Yeah. Uh, you heard one about this priest who pulls into town late, and um, goes in up to his hotel room, <clears throat> washes up, opens the Bible, reads the first page, closes it up, goes downstairs. He sees the hat checker and says, hey, how about coming up to my room with me? Hat checker says, father, I can't do that. What's the matter? You're a priest. It's okay. It's okay. It is written. It is written. He goes, he eats. <clears throat> he comes back. He sees her again. He says, how about coming up to my room with me? She says, father, you're a priest. I can't do that. He says, okay. It's written. It is written. It's okay. <clears throat> he goes and he, to the cafe and he gets her a cup of coffee. Comes back. He looks at her and says, I'm not coming up to my room. He says, she says, Father, you're a priest. I can't do that. He said, crap. It's, it's okay. It's okay. It is written. It's written. Finally, she relents. She goes up. And uh, they have an affair. And when it's over, she says, hey, what's this crap about? It is written. He brings her the Bible, opens the first page. Somebody wrote in there, hat checker, and puts out. <laughs> <laughs> This is kind of like army humor, too, right? <laughs> uh, no, I learned all that in uh, civilian life. Um, is there anything else you'd like to, you want to... About the military? Yeah. <clears throat> we really covered a lot. Yeah, once I start talking, I uh, find it hard to stop. No, no, no. Like it's, uh, you have a kind of a unique perspective. I think our disaster in Korea could really be traced to uh, MacArthur. As we defeated the North Korean uh, army, and we're advancing <coughs> to the uh, Yellow River, which was the Chinese border, there was really nothing left of the North Korean army. The Chinese warned us six times, stay 20 miles away from the Chinese border. Six times they warned us. And Truman, who was the president, ordered MacArthur, stay 20 miles away from the Chinese border. No need to go to the Chinese border. There was no Korean army left. Well, oh, MacArthur, being the war hawk that he was, said, nah, Chinese are scared of us. They won't do anything. And he marched the American troops right into the Yellow River. There's pictures of the American troops wading themselves in the deep water in the Yellow River. And guess what? The Chinese made good on their promise. <coughs> um, here, a piece of paper. Let me yeah. Tell you how they devastated the American Army so quickly. Here's the Yellow River. 
three roads, roughly, I'm not an expert, three roads. It's all mountainous. North Korea was pretty mountainous. So there's three roads leading up to the Chinese border. Right? Everything else was mountainous. Chinese soldiers with sticks of dynamite slid down these mountain roads, disabled the first American vehicle and the last. The rest were sitting ducks. No way to maneuver. A narrow mountain roads. Hundreds of tanks, <clears throat> armored vehicles of all types, trucks, didn't stand a chance. You can see that. No way to fight. They were just devastated. The volunteer first cab of the division supposedly had a great reputation in World War II and all that. <clears throat> Nothing was left for him. If it wasn't for the great American fleet, <clears throat> Korea is this, a, uh, a peninsula. <clears throat> American fleet was here, American fleet was here, and uh, they picked up stragglers. All the equipment, everything was left behind. American troops froze by the hundreds and thousands. It was the middle of winter, and uh, thousands of armored uh, vehicles were left behind and blown up. Thousands of American troops were left wounded and frozen in the soil. Contrary to what the news will tell you, we brought out all the wounded and all that. There was nothing left. The stragglers came back. I talked to these guys. It happened just... I got there just as the disaster unfolded. And uh, that's why MacArthur, uh, Truman fired MacArthur. Oh, you know about that? Yeah. He thought he was so big, he didn't have to take orders. And that uh, led to our disaster in Korea. Otherwise, the war was won. Yeah. I think there was some quote from Harry Truman saying, I didn't mind him saying that to Harry Truman, but he was saying that to the President of the United States. Saying so what? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll follow my, my strategy, not yours. Mm -hmm. Truman has to... He just disobeyed what uh, yeah. Truman uh, said. He said, um, they're scared of us, the Chinese, they'll never do nothing. And, um, uh, and that's uh, the disaster that unfolded. And so Truman had no other choice but to uh, can him. And Congress gave him such a big ovation. When that general in Russia would have been put up against the wall. Here, Every time one of our generals, I know we're getting kind of controversial here, but you take Vietnam. Every general we had there continued to lose the war more and more. And they come back here, they were given an additional star. Another general was sent to uh, Southeast Asia to continue the war, and he loses the war more and more. And he comes back home, they give him another star. Then we send a third general down there, and he's going to run the war. And of course, we didn't have failing. And all these generals that ran the war down there all ends up to be four and five star generals. Rewarded. Rewarded for what? I get it. In Russia, they would have been put up against the wall for losing. We re reward uh, our uh, military men who, uh, who screw up. As long as they follow orders. As long as they don't criticize their superiors, you know. It's kind of like the Chicago Police Force. You get away with anything as long as you um, don't criticize the system. In fact, our police force isn't even really police. They're really robbers in police uniforms. Whoa, that's pretty strong. I get in trouble with my mouth sometimes. Yeah. You can plainly see. And, uh, <clears throat> But you live in, you don't live in Chicago now, right? This flames. This flames. Oh, what happens if I live in Chicago? We would never say those things about Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, when they uh, find somebody who causes trouble for them, they don't care where you live, they'll be sending you tickets. They can get all the information on you. Uh, listen, uh, you know, our police force is like a, uh, not much different than a, uh, Los Angeles police force or police forces around the world. Maybe worse. 
I'm sure you read the papers. Out of 10,000 complaints against the Chicago police, four are investigated. One is suspended for a couple of weeks, and one gets a, a censure. Out of 10,000 complaints, well, you know this. I know, you know that. I'll tell you that. <clears throat> and, uh, so, um, but then again, I think uh, corruption is rampant uh, all over the world. Yeah. I think maybe we'll, will we, will we conclude the interview now, do you think? Should we conclude it now? Can't think of a better time. Well, last thing, I think we're in what some people might call World War III or World War IV. I'm taking, talking about the, uh, the uh, Islamo-fascists, as uh, President Bush one time uh, used that expression, Islamo-fascists. I think the uh, Christian world is asleep. And I think the uh, European Christians, if they don't wake up, another 20 years, Europe is going to be an Islamic continent. And why these people don't seem to care, it's beyond me. I don't have any particularly uh, love for the Vatican, but I think the only hope for uh, Christian Europe is probably uh, the Vatican and uh, Catholicism. The other Christian sects are uh, are of no consequence, and they're so liberal. They'd probably be kissing the Islamo fascists as they're ready to come with their sanitars to chop off their heads. I'd be interested if you have any comments on that. Yeah, I'm. Uh as a librarian, I read a lot of do a lot of reading and reviews, and um, yeah, I would. I, I, there, there's certainly uh, writing and uh, <coughs> to that effect, birth rates in Europe and uh, what constitutes being European, um, the future European civilization, um, the large uh, unassimilated minorities in various countries. Um, yeah, those are all prob those are all problematic. Are you, can I ask are you Catholic? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, then you pretty much know what I mean. The uh, Protestant, many. <clears throat> so we just, do you think we've reached the end of the interview? I think so. Yeah, okay. That was a wonderful interview. I've, uh, that view of war and the army, I haven't, uh, I haven't heard that just so colorfully yeah, and telling. And some of the unorthodox. Yeah, yeah, that's unorthodox. Yeah, yeah. But I still think it's, uh, I mean, somebody wants to read what it was like being in Korea. I think that, and the the, the Sigmund. Sorry, it might come after me. It's yes. Not at all. The Sigmund yes. Ring and that not. I think that was a good point. Um, so thank you, Mr. Schechter. Um,